I'm ready to proceed to, to welcoming Kathy Orlando, who is the National Director of CCL in Canada. She's also the International Outreach Manager, so she's got two, two very big jobs. But the most important thing for me to say about her is that she's my equivalent and she's been leading Canada in the way that I've been trying to lead uh, Australia over the last five years. She's been, she's been in, in the role a bit longer than me. She was also the first Canadian member of CCL. Um, she trained in, in the climate reality before she, she, she came across CCL. She has led CCL Canada for many years and very importantly, has um, enabled CCL Canada to succeed in getting carbon fee and dividends adopted in Canada. So we're going to be hearing more about that. She lives in a mining town, which is really, really, really important to know about her. And she works closely with Joe Robertson, who's the Global Outreach Director, and he's the one who helped us to set up CCL in Australia about six, six or seven years ago. So um, there's lots of overlaps between me and Kathy, and I'm delighted to welcome her on board today and to um, hear her telling us more about CCL in Canada and then particularly the carbon fee and dividend scheme that uh, has been adopted there and she is now fighting to, fighting to defend I gather. Over to you Kathy. Well thanks for that lovely introduction. Um, greetings it's the Friday evening in Canada and I am in a lockdown with two of my children and my husband, and they're very busy right now. So, uh -huh. I'm, I'm also a granddaughter of an Australian, so I wanted to just put that out as well. So I have strong ties to, um, to, us, to Australia. So I'm going to start my slideshow. Just give me a second here. And from the beginning. So thank you for having me here tonight. And thanks for that lovely introduction, Rod. I should only be speaking for about 10 minutes. And I'd like to thank you all for being part of Marshall's dream. I got, I got to meet Marshall Saunders in June of 2010 at a climate reality meeting. And he was a remarkable person. He believes in all of us. And he realized that if ordinary people like you and I we would need to organize ourselves and educate ourselves and give up our hopelessness and gain the skills to be effective with our government. And this is all just part of the evolution of humanity to be better citizens and Marshall showed us the way and thank you for being part of this amazing organization. Hmm. Just a quick reminder, we are part of a huge network of people in 58 countries now. And there are over 550 groups. And just for your notes from Canada, we have 37 active chapters covering just over 100 ridings or federal constituencies of the 338. We still call them ridings in Canada. That's a story <laughs> for another, <laughs> which means how far you can ride on a horse in a day. We still use that term, but anyways. And this was um, a, a fantastic moment in Canadian history. Our prime minister, a week after we had lobbied in Ottawa, made an announcement that Canada was going to price carbon and they were gonna give the money back to the people. But while we were on the Hill, a senator and a couple, sen and a couple members of parliament said, you're going to get what you lobby for, you're going to get it. So we were super excited when the announcement came. And this is what the uh, federal back, it's, we in Canada call it the federal backstop policy. It consists of two parts. One part is a price on fossil fuels, which most of us pay. So our home heating, our gasoline for driving, et cetera. And it also contains a second component for emissions intensive trade exposed industries. And this is called the output based pricing system. And it's basically cap and trade without a cap. So, and so the emissions intensive industries pay a proportion of that fuel tax. And it's based on basically how they are in their class of industries. And it sends a market signal and it is effective. It's in lieu of border carbon adjustments. 
to help our industries um, stay competitive. And it still sends a market signal. So overall, this very complex diagram here um, it tells what our federal backstop policy is because it's not it's not a national policy. You only get it if you opt into it or you don't have one yourself. So Ontario, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and a couple of the territories have this uh, backstop policy. They've, it's been imposed on Ontario, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, and um, the, the some of the territories have, have opted into it. Just briefly, um, the, the chart or the, the, the graph on the left shows how much greenhouse gas emissions will decrease with carbon pricing. And um, that's that red line. But if, it, if we did not have this carbon pricing policy and only had the regulations that are in place currently, then carbon emissions would go up. And you can see it in that little blue bubble. This diagram on the right with these four bubbles shows just how significant Canada's carbon pricing policy is. So it started at $20 a ton in 2018, goes up $10 a ton, and by 2022 uh, it'll be at $50 a ton, and then we don't know what happens after that. We do know that approximately 80% of Canadians come out ahead under this backstop policy. So these are the three provinces that are under the backstop policy. And you can see here, based on your household income, how much money you would get back. So the money goes back to the province. And then, the, then that money is based on how much carbon emissions your province has. You actually get the money back. You, you get the money from your province. So Ontario, which has a very low electricity grid, carbon on their electricity grid, has a much lower um, rebate, but we also pay much less compared to Alberta and Saskatchewan. So we got carbon fee and dividend. Now what? And just a quick reminder that we went to Parliament Hill 13 times, so you're going to Canberra to lobby is excellent. Um, we conducted over, over 700 lobbying sessions by 2018, and we had almost 3,000 times we appeared on the editorial pages of our newspapers, and we tracked all that, and we were telling our politicians about this. So one of the things we do is at election time, we educate the public about the various carbon pricing policies of the various parties so that they can have a better idea when they vote. We don't rank. Um, we do write a media release that goes with this, and it got published across Canada at election time. Um, at election time, we just had our election, so our carbon price thankfully passed through an election. About two-thirds of Canadians who voted voted for parties that had carbon pricing policies. Only one party doesn't, and it's the party that's blue, and they were elected mostly in the middle part of Canada, which is quite rural, and especially Alberta and Saskatchewan has a pretty heavy oil and gas industry. Same with West Eastern British Columbia out on the, up on the West Coast. Um, there was an exit poll of 1,100 Canadians and they, those who didn't vote conservative said the climate was one of their top voting issues. Of those that, uh, and 76 of those that didn't vote conservatives said the climate was one of their top voting issues and they gave the conservatives a ranking of D. 59% of them said they supported a carbon tax and only 16% were, were opposed. And I, I have to just point out a couple things here. Only 2% of Canadians belong to political parties and the majority of us are not faithful to one, one party. We, we are very centrist in our country. Our election was in October and we had over a million people on the streets during that, that September strike um, that happened with Fridays for Future. 
and our, our movement in Canada um, stuck quite closely to Greta's message, was, which was unite behind the science. So it didn't go after politicians or political parties. I think that may have helped somehow, just got people thinking about what we're doing to our children by not taking care of the climate without really making anybody feel terrible. So this is our timeline for what we've been doing. Um, it was very difficult before 2015. We had a conservative government that really didn't do much for the climate. Um, say that in a nonpartisan way, but then Trudeau and the Liberals formed government in October of 2015. They began what was called the Pan-Canadian uh, Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change, and they did a whole bunch of um, uh, negotiations with businesses and industry and the people, and lots and lots of engaging with us as they're supposed to under the United Nations Framework on Convention on Climate Change. They announced their policy in February 20, uh, of October of 2018. And really cool, what they did was um, they started giving us our dividends in March of, ninth, if you filled in your income tax in March of 2019, and then the fees began in April of 2019. And then we had an election. And now our next steps are to improve the national carbon pricing policy and continue to build political will for carbon pricing. And I have to say, in many ways, it got a lot harder because now we really have to get into the weeds. So what are the weeds? Um, we want the carbon price to rise past 2022, when at that point it halts at $50 a ton. We know from economic studies done by major think tanks in Canada that it must rise to at least $220 a ton by 2030 to even reach our lame Paris goals, because our Paris goals are not science-based um, in Canada. We don't get a dividend check, we get a line in our income tax. So we're going to be lobbying quite heavily to get that dividend check. And we're gonna be pushing really hard for that in the next two years because there's been a lot of pushback um, what, since we um, got our carbon pricing policy, um, mainly from Facebook groups and um, some of the, not the big oil companies, but some of the smaller oil companies in Canada, because they really are not going to survive a, car a carbon price. They just don't, they just won't for a multitude of reasons. Ultimately, it will need border carbon adjustments instead of that output-based carbon pricing system that we have. It needs to be harmonized nationally, so we need full cooperation of the Canadian Confederation of Provinces and Territories, as well as the political parties. Um, there are a couple Supreme Court rulings that are supposed to come out soon to um, judge on the constitutionality of the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act, and we're all on pins and needles waiting to see what's going to happen because uh, at the, anyways, and we need our climate targets and a bucket list of accountability measures enshrined under national law. And then that's it for like the Canada's carbon pricing policy. Um, and then there were some questions sent to me and then I can answer any questions thereafter. So is there any evidence yet of the impact of the implement, implementation of carbon fee and dividend on emissions? Nope, it's too early. It's just a year old and this COVID crisis has really um, just thrown a monkey wrench into knowing whether or not this will be working. Our economy is turned upside down just like everybody else's in the world. So, but there is a lot of economic modeling done by the Canadian government. We have institutions that require, um, that are, uh, okay, so what we have is what's called the Parliamentary Budget Office and they were instituted by the previous government, the previous conservative government, and they do heavy uh, studies to look at, you know, whether these policies are working or not. So they're saying it's, it's working okay, it's not going to impact Canadians, our GDP should be okay, our environment ministry is saying the same, and then independent think tanks are saying the same, that emissions will go down and our, there should be no impact on our GDP. Um, and really not a lot of data about the impact on jobs yet, but we know from British Columbia that they, they saw an increase in uh, jobs in the sector um, uh, for clean energy and, um, and, and that whole uh, growing uh, in a green way. And the next question, what are the corporates and fossil fuel 
uh, corporates in particular saying and doing now that the policy is in place? Well, we have, as you'll see in a moment, we have um, our major oil companies are actually pro-carbon pricing. Um, Canadians, um, one of the good things the previous conservative government did was invested a lot of money in carbon capture and sequestration. So we do have a pretty, well, it's an okay uh, CCS. I can't comment. Technically, I'm not qualified, but I know that in Canada, we have a carbon capture and sequestration innovation um, part of our economy, and they can't make um, that in that part of the industry work without a carbon price. So our some of our big fossil fuel companies are pro carbon pricing. Um, but they still want handouts and stuff like that too. So it's, it's a, it's complicated. And again, the smaller fossil fuel companies in our country, um, some of them seem to be behind this huge ax the carbon tax campaign um, that, uh, that ran during the election and continues to run. So the last question was about the carbon uh, pricing leadership coalition and for anyone New on the call, the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition is an initiative from the World Bank and it was launched prior to the Paris climate uh, agreements in 2015. It launched during UN Climate Week in New York City. Um, Citizens Climate Lobby is one of the founding members and what they do is they work together, members work together to share best practices for carbon pricing. So Canada, our minister at that time, Minister McKenna, um, she was the high level co-chair. She has a degree in law as well as a, a degree from the London School of Economics. And um, she, she led Canada through all of this. And we had the largest number of companies at that time join the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition. And if you're looking closely here, it's our big oil industries like Shell and Suncor and our, and our big banks. And if you don't know this, approximately 15% of all um, bank financing is done from Canada for the oil and gas industry. So we've got our big banks in here. We've got the major cement association, Unilever, um, yeah, so we, uh, we had and forest companies, our largest grocery stores, so they, they joined. Um, and I think this, um, so how would, did this play a role? I think, in my view, um, in the, to put it into a metaphor, there are bullies on this, on this, in this fight that we're in to create a low carbon economy. And what are you supposed to do when you're confronted with a bully? Unite, you unite with a whole bunch of people. So it, it makes you a stronger coalition um, when facing these bullies. So I think our government wisely um, brought all these businesses on board and designed a carbon price that all of us could live with. It's not perfect. It needs a lot of changes, but certainly was a great start. So yeah, um, I think they helped immensely um, in, in guiding our development of, of our policy as well as building political will behind the scenes so there wouldn't be so much pushback. And we also did something locally. We had an open letter to the government of Canada and we got our volunteers to ask um, their local businesses to sign on to be pro-carbon pricing. And we got close to 300 signatures and it, I found it to be quite valuable. So that's our carbon pricing policy. And those are answers to some of the questions, but I am open to answering any more questions you may have. So I'm back. Thank you very much, Kathy, for that. That's brilliant. brilliant. Um, it gives us a real context for where we are and um, it's kind of nice in a way for us to have a, a country like um, Canada that's kind of, um, you know, a few years ahead in terms of the, the, the process. Um, we were ahead of you for a little while until um, we lost our carbon price, but um, we're now sort of uh, obviously wanting to 
uh, learn as much as we can from what you've done to be able to really understand more about what we can do next. So thank you very much for that. Um, because I'm on my phone, I can't see who's, who's um, putting their hands up for, for questions. So can I hand that back to you, Tom, for that section? Also, you might be able to see the chat questions as well, which I can't see. You're on mute, Tom. Tom, you're muted. Thanks, Howard. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I see John Miller's been waving his hand wildly, and I just thought uh, he should get the opportunity first. Just a quick one, John. Yeah, just a quick one. Uh, welcome, Kathy. Earlier this morning, I was playing a Tom, Stomp and Tom CD with Sudbury Saturday Night. <laughs> if that makes you feel at home at all. But I also attended a seminar in Sydney with uh, the former mayor of Vancouver, Gregor, who had a lot to say about transport and greening the economy. And I believe he's done some good things there. Okay, he's no longer mayor. But um, the whole, apart from Uncle Doug in, our, in Ontario, uh, the whole Canada scene is certainly a long way ahead of Australia at the moment. So well done. Oh, thanks. Can't no, take well, credit for it. A... <laughs> I see in the chat room, uh, Paul Loring has sent a, a, a question. Uh, he says he thinks you said that Ontario is opposed, yet at the national level, a high proportion are supportive of a carbon tax. I guess he's just seeking confirmation of that. Yes, that's true. So we had an election in Ontario two years ago and a, a switch of um, government. So we went from a liberal, liberal to a progressive conservative government. And um, this progressive conservative government is very anti-carbon tax. So they scrapped the cap and trade that we have here in Ontario and is now challenging the government of Canada on the constitutionality of imposing carbon taxes on the province. So yeah, that's true. And um, just a note, something you might want to note, Ontario also decreased its greenhouse gas emission targets. And there's a group of youth suing the Ontario government for jeopardizing their future um, and, their, and their chartered rights. And my daughter is the lead litigant and she's 12 years old. <laughs> good, good. I see uh, Don from Western Australia. Just unmute you there, Don. Um, yeah, Kathy, um, we're quite aware that in the US they've got quite a large organisation behind the CCL. They've got staff and degree. I was just interested to the degree um, or the size of the organisation that's um, been managing to do this in Canada. We have no paid staff. I do this, I do Canada on top of my job. So most weeks I'm working 50, 60 hours a week except in the summer where it's a lot less. We run by action teams and we're very focused on carbon pricing, very focused. And anytime somebody suggests a project, my question is, okay, so how's that going to build political will locally for our volunteers for carbon pricing? And if they can't answer that question, then it kind of falls by the wayside. Um, it's just where, um, I think the difference between Canada and the USA um, is we have a stronger democracy. If you look on the democracy scales, I mean, it's a flawed, it's a flawed democracy in the United States now. Um, they have Citizen United. Um, we have a stronger media here in Canada. We have huge rules around our media through the, uh, the CRTC, which is the Canadian radio and telecoms industry, um, that, in, that doesn't allow them to lie to the degree that happens south of the border. So um, we've chosen, I mean, I'd like to be bigger and that's the goal someday, but the fight has always been to get carbon pricing and we've managed to do it without staff. It's not sustainable though. Um, that is a long-term goal, but still we're now fighting to hold on to it. Um, so my, we've just have really good volunteers. Um, We've got people that have been with us for 10 years, like since the very beginning, and they just help us stay focused. They know how hard this work is and everything's run by action teams. 
very, and I have to say those action teams are quite focused and they have to produce things and they have to have fun. Um, that's, that's critical. We have a few rules when we run action teams or at least the ones I'm on. Um, if somebody goes off topic, um, we, we will say squirrel to them on a, on a conference call because, you know, squirrel, you know, like a dog looking for a squirrel. So if they're going off topic, we remind them they're getting off topic and then that gets everybody laughing. And when somebody gets a little, you know, negative, cause you know, we're all human. We all, well, somebody will say meow and, um, meow like a cat. So then again, that gets us laughing. So we have, um, we do, we've just got a really good team of people. They know to stay really focused, but at the same time, we're not so focused that we don't see the bigger scene. Um, it's really important to, to balance the goal. So we have what we lobby for. And when we lobby, that's, that's it. Like we're narrowly focused on that, but we spend a lot of time training our volunteers to understand all the other stuff that needs to be done so that they're equipped to answer any question, but keep steering the politician back to carbon pricing. Thanks, Kathy. We've got millions of questions coming up here. Ivan's been waving madly there. Ivan, I'll unmute you and you can have your go. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Kathy, for your thoughts. Uh, is Canada doing anything about um, demanding or getting carbon offsets for emissions that you do have? Yeah, that's a bit of a hot spot here in Canada. Um, there, it's complex, but yeah, they're trying to get offsets. Yeah, yes, they are, and I don't. I'm not. I don't have the details on it, but it is a bit of a uh, a tricky situation here, and I I can't go into the details because I'm I'm not a detailed person. I'm the grand picture seer, but um, I. Think I think if I could explain it, but not be quoted, that would be great. We have um, natural gas and there's a subset of that's pushed in our economy that is pushing for some sort of offsets for natural gas because it has less of a greenhouse gas impact than coal, which we know is maybe not so true. So there's a little bit of a tension there. Um, that's not our wheelhouse, but I know that that's going on. So that's just one of the problems with the offsets that we have here in Canada. Good, thanks, Kathy. Um, a question from Simon Belly. Uh, what was the incentive for companies to join the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition? Hmm. What was the incentive? Um, I think any smart How could business. could we encourage it? No, yeah. I, well, you know what? I think any smart business person knows what is coming. If we don't price carbon, if we don't cut these emissions, we're not going to have business. As we're seeing with this COVID crisis, we don't have a resilient economy and we have to price carbon. We have to change our economy. We have to price pollution. We have to account for things that we're doing to our environment or our, our environment will collapse. So um, as well, uh, when I was at COP25 in Madrid, I went to three different sessions run by the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition. And one of them was about how businesses that are pricing carbon internally are doing better than their competitors. It's just, if you price carbon, you, you your business becomes a fish more efficient. Um, and I think at, at the end of the day, most people are good. Most people are good and businesses are good. They want to do good. And they just need to unite against that, whatever that is, sociopathic, ignorant, I don't know what it is, a subset in the business world that just can't seem to grasp that we must do something about climate change. So I think the incentive is for the greater good at the end of the day. Okay, thanks. Uh, Jess has said she missed the table about the three provinces. Um, she's thinking that just the three provinces that are involved in carbon price, but I, I know that's not true, but she's asking, is it right that those provinces 
did the electricity prices go up and uh, and uh, but the public didn't realize they were getting the dividend oh yeah it's been horrible because our our um carbon pricing policy we get the dividend inside of our income taxes most people didn't know that we got it and so there was an, a major carbon tax campaign that lied to people literally it was all over facebook so there was a counter campaign and you might have seen the stickers um, on on one of the diagrams um that um people bought uh, yeah there, it, it's been really hard. So if you do get a carbon pricing policy I, um, that's revenue neutral and rebates back to the citizens, I can't stress enough how important it is to get that dividend check. Um, it's made it really difficult. And one of the reasons why we're fighting so hard to get dividend checks is because we won't get the price up to $220 a ton without the machine that, whatever that is, that subset of the pop, of the that is fighting us on this carbon tax, that they will just try to dupe the population. It, it, it's been very, it was, it was I, that's what I said um, earlier. I said, it got harder. It got harder in two ways. It got harder because the pushback got really complex and nasty. And it's like, wait, Canadians are lying? They're lying on Facebook? Canadians are nice. We don't do this. This is so not what it, as I, I imagine my country would be doing, but whatever. Maybe, or maybe not always that nice. And then another thing that happened is that some of our volunteers thought, oh, we've got a carbon pricing policy. Now what can we lobby for? So I've spent about a year and a half trying to just, with a subset of our volunteers to say, um, are you getting what's going on? Or we kind of hold on to this carbon pricing policy. So a lot of education of the volunteers as well. Something I did was not expecting that there was two tensions happening this major pushback of lying, and then also a subset of our volunteers who were, okay, like now we'll, we'll lobby for something else. And so, yeah, okay. And uh, Paul, I've lost him just a session. Uh, I'm trying to make breakout rooms in the background here, excuse me. Um, Kathy, uh, Paul Boring has had his hand up electronically for a while there. Paul, um, I'll unmute you there. There you go. Uh, hello, Kathy. Um, I, I'm interested from two perspectives. Um, my older brother lives in downtown to, Toronto, and um, I was meant to be holidaying there this year. And um, so that's very sad. Um, so instead, um, I'm having a Zoom meeting with him on Monday and my niece in London. So um, it'd be nice to actually see if I can browbeat them into uh, getting some more interest in this. But, uh, but putting that to one side, I was interested in that, the fact that the way the dividend is approached is a two-phased one that it's given to the states and then the states then give it to the individuals through the tax line. Um, and I, I wondered there whether then there was actually a mutually a, a mutual political benefit in that it, it can be made visible that your state is actually getting that refund and whether that's something that's worth doing politically of marketing the, the benefit of this approach by saying that there's a, there's a state benefit uh, as well as you know the, the uphill struggle you're having trying to um, get the message over that people are getting it but it's hidden in the tax one liner. Um, so just to be clear um, every province and territory can choose their own carbon pricing policy and the backstop policy will be imposed on them if they don't have a, an equivalent carbon pricing policy um, so Ontario, Saskatchewan, Alberta are having this imposed on them. And yes, the money goes directly back to the, what we call a province, and then that money is distributed back to the citizens. Um, so, and I don't, we've just refined our guidelines for what we feel are good, uh, what we feel should be the boundaries or um, what we need in Canada for carbon pricing. 
And one, uh, we had two lawyers helping us, retired lawyers helping us with this document. And what became really clear to me as we did this over the past three months is that the way the constitution is set up in Canada is quite different from Britain because um, we were trying to think about Westminster democracies and how to make this work for us, right? That what, they don't have that subnational governments that they have to deal with. So I'm just wondering if you have the same sort of relationship like Canada has um, between the, what you call states and your federal government. And I, I'm, as I'm thinking at this call, I've, I've never thought of this before, is what we're experiencing in Canada is probably very applicable to what you will be experiencing in Australia. And it's not a bad idea to go after state level carbon pricing. That's what the United States is doing. That's what Canada did when we were under the Harper government. Our, our, our subnational governments went ahead. And then at the end of the day, when we finally you know, started coalescing together, um, we started, you know, we're start now starting to figure out how to harmonize them. So I think Canada um, has a, a lot to share um, with you in your journey to get carbon pricing in Australia. Thanks, Kathy. Um, just uh, busy here. Now, other hands. Uh, perhaps one last question before we wrap up it might be. Uh, all we have time for. Um, I noticed Joyce put one oh, on the chat that might be worth, is very appropriate, I think, um, that I can't see now. Um, Maybe Joyce could ask it and let yes, you get on Joyce. with your work, Tom. Sorry, I'm busy trying to break out people into rooms and uh, I can't okay, see Joyce just, to. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm on now. I've, I've just unmuted myself, but I'm just, so thanks, you know, sir. talking about that idea about the, um, the the visibility of the of the dividend. Is that does the government do a tax rebate because it's easier for them, or because it it doesn't want it to be visible? Um, what what's the reason for that? It's easier. We're pretty sure they did it because it's easier, um, and there was a lot of pushback. Uh, so this is all hearsay from members of parliament, um, but they told uh, a couple of politicians told us that the finance committee and the finance um, department basically said they didn't want to do a check that it would be easier to have it, uh, it, it in our income tax. But in Canada, we already are a sub set of our population already gets dividend checks for various things. Um, we have child tax credit. Um, we have a, what we call the GST rebate. So it's it's already in our systems. Um, and we're hoping that they'll rethink this and that's what we'll be pushing for really hard over the next couple of years is to get them to move away from the income tax line and over to the rebate check. Or as the younger people say, what's a check? What's a check? <laughs> it's, a, it's a a bank transfer. I didn't realize he didn't know what a check was. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Um, yeah, we have the same situation here, and um, but fortunately, we uh, were very advanced in terms of using um, bank transfers and electronic transfers here, and um, and I know that that's one place where the U.S. is kind of behind us. So um, so yeah, we'll be we'll be certainly pushing for for electronic transfers if and when um, we get our carbon um, fee and dividend in place. Kathy, it's been really, really useful to hear everything that you've said and uh, to get a, a picture of the um, complexities of the process there. And um, you know, we do have a, a federal system as well, which, which brings about complications. But interestingly, we're in the position where our states are gen at the moment are generally more progressive than our federal government. So we're, we're seeing them as a, as a, as a, as a big advantage. Um, but uh, yes, we've learned so much and I've, I've made copious notes and um, no doubt other people have as well. So um, many, many thanks and um, thank, thank you particularly for staying up late um, on a Friday night when you could be sleeping. I know you're an early starter as well. So um, 
hope you have a great a great night's sleep after this. Thank you for this. Stay safe and um, cheering you on from Canada. Anything I can do to help, I'm here for you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you. Much Ciao. appreciated.